Thanks, Claudia, for helping to host. It's good to see you all. Last week, Eve and I were in the space together, and uh, that was a real pleasure. The space is looking so great. I know Teague has brought his uh, decorative talents to bear with that, and it's just looking better and better, so that's exciting. But tonight I'm in my home across the bay in Berkeley. It's good to see you wherever you are. I'm uh, streaming in from uh, Liz John Ohlone land here. And maybe take a moment to, let's all of us drop in and take a few breaths so that we can feel that we're landing together. Kind of sloughing off the activity and the swirling of the day's activity with the out breath, allowing the eyes to close and take some deep breaths. Notice if you're holding any tension in the body, releasing that with the out breath, feel that tension unraveling, unwinding as you let go, letting go of any holding of the face, maybe the space between the eyebrows, or the jaw. And as you feel yourself settling more in this moment, in this time and place, internally acknowledge where you sit, where you lie, in this moment, the indigenous land that you're on. And feeling a sense of gratitude and in a sense, a quality of reverence for those who've walked this land before us. And also a sense of gratitude and reverence to our mentors, our teachers, our guides, our spiritual friends who have helped guide us on our way through life. Those moments that have brought us here together in this moment, in this moment, in this moment. And feeling yourself settling in even more fully now, noticing your posture as we take another step into the contemplative practice, the bhavana, the meditation. You may wish to rock forward and back a little on your seat, noticing if you're leaning forward or slouched backward in the seat. See if you can find a nice equilibrium so that the spine grows up and out of the bowl of the pelvis like a, a sunflower in a pot. Reaching up towards the sun and that spine lifting up towards the heavens. You may even feel that it's blooming like a thousand petaled sunflower or lotus in the crown of the head. The crown chakra. And again, feel tension melting out of the skull releasing from the face, from the neck and shoulders. The mid-back and the solar plexus. The low back and the abdomen.
the buttocks, the hips, relaxed and supported against the seat. And the legs in a comfortable position. If you're in a chair, feel the soles of the feet nice and square, rooting into the earth against the floor. And then widen the scope of your awareness to fill the entire body all at once, from the crown of the head to the soles of the feet, to the periphery of the skin, the global awareness of the body, sensations within the body, and the sensations of the breath as it naturally flows in and out. And notice if there's any stance or assumption you may be bringing into your meditation practice, attention or a fixation of what meditation is or isn't supposed to be and see if you can release that. And just let yourself be. This quality of beingness, of being in the moment, a human being. you just let yourself be. And if you're bringing fatigue or distraction or discomfort or ease, whatever you have with you now, Whatever is accompanying you in the sit, just allow it to be here. You don't need to cut out or alter or change or omit parts of yourself to meditate. See if you can welcome it here now. Releasing the project of fixing or modifying your experience. Instead, aligning with what is true right now, what is here. And again, notice any fixation, any subtle or gross grasping onto thoughts or ideas. Again, that's the eye maker, the ahankara, coming in and habitually, in a sense, thinking it needs to entertain you. And now you can tell it, you don't need to do that. Let's just be together. Awareness and the eye maker. If you notice the subtle grasping, winding up, tightening 
its grip around a thought, a judgment, an expectation, a feeling. With the out-breath, just unleash, unravel it, like you're releasing the grip of a fist. Release, relax, and allow yourself to be as you are. With a natural flow of an easeful breath, the sensations of the body. All of these arisings and passings occur within this domain of awareness. And see if you can maintain this quality of awareness as you just gently, naturally open your eyes, including the visual, the form, appearing to the eyes as well, but without changing that quality of being, without preference or rejection, Feel free to blink whenever you need to. The gaze is at a comfortable angle down towards the floor. Allow your consciousness to be like a lantern consciousness, diffuse, like you can see 360 degrees around you. Soften the gaze. And feel how your awareness suffuses the visual stimuli just as it suffuses the tactile, the auditory, the olfactory, and the gustatory senses. If at any time the visual field becomes too stimulating, you can allow the eyes to close if you wish, especially if you're just getting used to this style of practice. Whether the eyes are open or closed, release the illusory duality of inner and outer. and rest in that quality of awareness, like space pervading the mind and all the senses. Free of center and periphery, rest your attention in the experience of being aware. And just allow yourself to be simple. Release complexity with the out-breath. And allow yourself to rest at ease within yourself. Releasing that eye-maker, the ahankara project. Put it down. Just allow yourself to be simple, to be present, wakeful yet relaxed.
Release with a sense of relaxation and allow the mind to settle in its natural state, free of grasping, free of distraction. When the attention grows more refined, we can detect those subtle moments of distracting when it begins. And right then and there, not a complex moment, just notice and release back into the quality of awareness. In a sense, let that thought just dissipate back into the space from which it arose. No need to uh, apply an antidote. Just simply release the grasping. The fixation. In Tibetan, the phrase is le ki le. It means relaxedly release. Relaxedly release. Allow the mind to rest, to settle in its natural state. Limpid, calm, like a mountain lake. still, unbuffeted by the winds of compulsive ideation,
And now if the eyes are open, gently allow them to close. And now we'll shift into a tonglen, practice of sending and receiving, compassion practice. And in tonglen, we can work with ourself. That's often the first step. We can also work with a loved one, a friend, a family, someone toward whom we feel affection and care toward And also work with a neutral person, someone we may not have strong attachment or aversion towards. So-called neutral person might be somebody you see in your neighborhood or someone in a neighborhood store that you don't know very well, but you see from time to time. The majority of people on this planet are so-called neutral people because we just don't know them. It's very fruitful to work with that. And then lastly, working with the so-called enemy, the challenging person, someone that triggers us. But tonight, what I'd like to do is to first begin with some breathing, feeling the Buddha nature, the luminous orb of light, like a sun glowing within the heart chakra. And then I'll allow you to just let the mind roam and choose who you would like to work with, self, loved one, neutral, or so-called enemy. We'll have time to work with one or two. So let's begin by breathing. Aware of implementing a certain technique of using the mind to help transform the mind this age-old practice of Tonglen. But doing so within this fabric of awareness that was cultivated, the quality of awareness doesn't change. Just feel some intentional breaths now and feel that you're breathing directly in and out of the heart space, the center of the sternum, the heart chakra, and feel there like a tingling, a a spark of light, like a candle flame, enlivened by each breath, the oxygen building that flame, the out breath helping the warmth spread through the body, through the heart, Inhale directly into the heart space from all sides of your body. Exhale, breathing out from all sides of the body, from the heart. Each breath enkindles this quality of luminosity, of awareness, of a wakefulness, a warmth at the heart space. knowing that this spark of consciousness is beyond harm, beyond birth and death. It's this Vajra-like, adamantine nature of your own mind, imbued with love, imbued with tenderness and wisdom. If that's a foreign concept to you, then just take some time exploring what it would feel like if it were true. What would it feel like if it were true that I had this wakeful, immutable, benevolent, loving nature at the core of my being?
Another kind of warm up or preliminary step is to work with texture. Imagine that with the in breath, any dark, cloudy, smoky vapors breathing in directly into the orb of light at your heart, where it's transformed and illuminated, and the out breath is sending out a cool, clear, healing light in all directions. Just working with texture of breathing in the smog, the smoky vapor, where it's transformed at that immutable heart space, breathing out a cool, clear, healing, feeling, a breeze or light. And take about 10 more breaths like this, the rhythm of your own breath, working with texture. And now allowing the mind to alight upon the object of Donglan now, whether it's yourself or difficult emotions you're having or a loved one or a neutral or so-called enemy, just allow the mind to roam for a moment, feel into who you'd like to work with. If it's yourself, do self Donglan. If it's another person, then imagine them as clearly as you can in front of you. Surrounded by a cloud of smoke, signifying their ailment, their challenge. And you breathe that texture in, transform it at the heart, and breathe out the cool, clear, healing light, or breeze. Spend some time doing this in silence.
A few more breaths here with this object of Donglen. Feeling the sadness, the pain, the suffering diffuse uh, with each out breath. And ask yourself, how would I feel or how would this person feel if they were completely free of their suffering? And then allow that to dissolve and move to the next person or object of your meditation. Maybe another person. Maybe if you didn't work with yourself, you feel that you'd like to work with yourself. Maybe somebody triggered you today at work or in your family. Maybe external circumstances aren't going your way. Are we blaming someone for our suffering? Let your mind alight upon the next object and we'll spend about 10 breaths or so working the Donglen, inhaling whatever ailment there is with the smoky vapor texture into the heart space, transform it there, and then with the out breath, a cool, clear, healing wind or light flows around them, helps to dissipate and bring the remedy of healing, of release, whatever that may be. Stay with it. This is like shamatha. If the mind distracts, bring it back. with a gentleness, spaciousness. This isn't easy. Build your strength here with mindfulness and presence. And over the next few breaths, feel that ailment, confusion, delusion, suffering, dissipating and healing. And 
what would this person be or feel like, look like, if they were free of that particular problem, ailment, confusion, neuroses? If it's you, how would you feel? Just a thought experiment. Give that to yourself. What would I feel like? What would they be like without that particular issue? Resolved it. Healed it. Make a prayer, may it be so. May it be so. Now releasing that, and now we're going to do a global Tonglen. Now imagine that you pan way back, all the way back, so that it's as if your vantage point is from the moon. You're sitting on the moon, looking upon the earth in the distance, this blue, green, and white orb of life. And yet intuitively you can feel that there's imbalance, there's suffering, there's violence and pollution, and confusion. samsara, the cycle of existence, birth and death, impermanence, change causing so much confusion and suffering. And imagine all of that like a smoky vapor surrounding the earth. And with this courageous heart, this orb of light at your heart, your bodhicitta, heart. With the in-breath, imagine that you're breathing in the suffering directly into the heart space, transforming it and releasing, sending healing, balance, peace. With the out-breath, you could feel it like the rays of the sun or a cosmic wind Inhaling, drawing it in, transforming it at the heart. Exhale, sending the remedy. Allow your intuition to roam. Stay with the breath. Breathing in the suffering, transforming it at your heart, and breathing out the remedy. A sincere wish. May you all be well. May you be happy. May you be free of suffering. Continue like this. About 10 more breaths. May seal with the out-breath, uh, violence turning to peace, 
conflict to resolution, pollution to purification, balance. And with the outbreath, send that wish of to the earth and its inhabitants. May you all be free of suffering and its causes. And like a vision quest, imagine now what that would look like. What would that feel like? Putting down of weapons, stopping of greed and resources enough for all. People happy in their homes, safe, free from harm. Children playing without a care safe and loved, animals free of their cages and mistreatment, free to roam. What comes to your mind? What would it look like? What would the world feel like? Even your smaller world, what would it feel like? to be well, to be happy, to have what you need, to flourish. What is the good news? And then gently, slowly dissolve that visualization and just allow yourself to rest free of doing anything, free of prayers, free of visualization, free of breath awareness, just rest in the quality of being. Returning to that natural state. No need to fix anything. Nothing's wrong. Just be at peace within yourself for a few more moments here. Let's close by dedicating any positive juice, any energy we've cultivated as a collective, as a Dharma collective, for the benefit of all beings everywhere. Like a drop of water releasing into the vast ocean of positive energy, it becomes limitless when we release and dedicate. We give it away. It becomes abundant and ever-flowing. Thank you. I have a poem I'd like to read to you. Hold on. This is from one of my favorite books of Thich Nhat Hanh, Call Me By My True Names. Beautiful uh, book of poetry. As you may know, he passed away recently. 
Vietnamese Zen teacher, humanitarian, focused on engaged Buddhism, right? He came and um, actually emigrated to France during the Vietnam War. And this poem came to me while we were meditating. It's called The Good News. It's on page 188. They don't publish the good news. The good news is published by us. We have a special edition every moment, and we need you to read it. The good news is that you are alive, and that the linden tree is still there, standing firm in the harsh winter. The good news is that you have wonderful eyes to touch the blue sky. The good news is that your child is there before you and your arms are available. Hugging is possible. They only print what is wrong. Look at each of our special editions. We always offer the things that are not wrong. We want you to benefit from them and help protect them. The dandelion is there by the sidewalk, smiling its wondrous smile, singing the song of eternity. Listen, you have ears that can hear it. Bow your head, listen to it. Leave behind the world of sorrow and preoccupation and get free. The latest good news is that you can do it. <laughs> What's the name of the poem, Chandra? The Good that, News. The Good News. Thank the Good you. News. Thank you. Page 188 okay. on my edition of Call Me By My True Names by Tik Nyat Han. Yeah, it's not available yet. It's going to come out, I think, in October. I've looked for it. For a more recent edition, anyway. Maybe, yeah. I mean, this is yeah. really old. I've had this for a year, a couple decades. So, Parallax Press, Berkeley, California. Um, this is an edition. This was published in 1999. last millennium. <laughs> yeah. You're welcome, Denise. Thank you. So I'd love to open it up for questions, comments, observations about the practice. How was it uh, resting in awareness and then flowing from that into Tonglen and having a bit more freedom about which object you focus on? How did you like the moon vantage point? That is a, a meditation uh, version of the Tonglen that I learned from Pema Chodron. Uh, she came to Tara Mandala a few years ago, maybe five years ago, and gave teachings. She didn't want to prepare a speech. She's quite old now and said she doesn't like to prepare talks anymore. She just likes to show up and see what wants to happen. There were probably 200 people there. And um, she's really like the OG of Donglen, at least in the United States. Of course, it's been around for a long time, but she learned it from her teacher, Chogyam Trungpa, and she's a nun. She's in her 80s now, pay my children. And I, because of that, I thought, well, I have to ask her to teach us, to guide us in a Tonglen practice. I'd never received it from her live. I had just read 
it in books from her. I'd received it live from other teachers, but never from her. And I wanted that kind of oral transmission from her. So I raised my hand, I stood up and asked her if she would be so kind as to guide us in a Donglen practice. And she did, and she didn't give much introduction. She didn't feel like she had to explain the logic of it or the texture and the heart and, you know, all of the, the sort of couching that usually Donglen is placed in. She just, in a sense, said, close your eyes. Well, first she's like, oh, really? Oh, you want to do that? Hmm, okay. <laughs> she had us close our eyes, and uh, she guided us to imagine that we were on the moon, looking down at the earth and breathing in the suffering of the earth, breathing out the remedy, the healing. And we did that for like five, 10 minutes and it was so beautiful, I loved that. I'd never read that in any of her books. Now, provided I haven't read every single one of her books, but her main book on Donglen is, um, oh, what is it, it's a classic. It's been so long since I've read it, it's, uh, Somebody remind me if you can. We talked a lot about it back in the day, you know, a few years ago when we were doing a lot of Tonglen. Something like, as you are, or coming, at, come as you are. I can't remember. Starting where you are? Yeah, start where you are. Start where you are. Yeah, come as you are is a Nirvana song, isn't it? <laughs> Start Where You Are by Pema Chodron. It's, it's, it's kind of old and maybe a little outdated, but it's a good, really earthy, down-to-earth. Basically, it's a transcription of her oral teachings, her talks on Tonglen and the Lojong slogans. So we used that as a book, study book, for our um, classes at Against the Stream and then turned into San Francisco Dharma Collective. So that is a really good resource. She's a wonderful teacher. I hope you enjoyed that part of it. Claudia says, it felt great to just be so relaxing, and the perspective from the moon was lovely. I could really see the earth. That's great. Good. I have a question, Shanda. Yeah. Uh, when you asked us to open our eyes, mm. and then you said something about a dilution between the difference between in and out, or something like that, you said. Right. Can you, can you explain? Can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Right. That was, for me, just a tip to give to you uh, to feel whether you're meditating with the eyes open and that was fine, or if you felt uncomfortable or distracted by the visual field to allow them to close, that's also fine. Regardless of whether your eyes were open or closed, to, to really realize that, that the duality of inner and outer is an illusion, so to speak, especially in the meditative state. So to dissolve that uh, duality mm -hmm. and realize, look, I can, awareness is all pervasive. It's in every cell. A space is all pervasive. It's in every cell of my being. And then it's surrounding me. It's limitless. Just likewise, space doesn't mean when your eyes are closed, you're just in your head mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. or when the eyes are open then you're more diffuse you can have that diffuse lantern consciousness even when the eyes are closed we can be small-minded and myopic even when the eyes are open <laughs> that was what that was focused on yeah okay. thank you good question Denise says, it felt fabulous my lungs just cleared during Tonglen for the first time in days and the world I hope felt those waves of love. Yes. <laughs> good, good. Yeah, I see a hand. Michael. I mean, the whole practice was beautiful. And um, uh, the way you talk about starting from where you are, as we did, um, just with the eyes open practice, I have been struggling for a lifetime with eye open practice. And when you said, 360 degrees around um, that just opened it up because I don't have my eyes in the back of my head are I'm, I'm still working on it but um, it, it allowed because I couldn't see in the back of my head it allowed a sort of openness I 
I, t I tend to sort of stare in when mm -hmm. my eyes, and every day I don't do that, but when I sit in, I, I tend to stare in. Then I, I once described 180, then I'm trying to see 180 because I can't see 360. It just opened it up and it was really light. It was beautiful. So mm -hmm. thank you for that very simple bit of, a, of the meditation. Good, good. And now you've experienced it. Now you feel it. So that's there for you. Yeah, that's a common uh, instruction in Dzogchen. It's something that helped me a lot too, Michael. Uh, they, they often say, feel as if you could see 360 degrees. And so it kind of pops it open. There is this feeling of suddenly like, I have no head. <laughs> or at least it broadens it more than it normally would be. And then I remember learning during this, I actually learned this phrase from a teacher at our family camp at Tara Mandala. We used to have summer family camps before COVID hit. And one time there was a counselor there who was focusing, teaching the kids meditation and mindfulness and how to walk through nature in mindful awareness and really sense your environment. And right before we went, we all held hands in a circle and some of the parents were there too, and with the kids and the counselor, and the counselor guided us in a little cont contemplation before we took our nature walk and invited us to feel the difference between spotlight consciousness, which is what you described in the sense of that more focused, which has its benefits, right? We Sometimes we need to be like that, versus lantern consciousness, that more diffuse awareness. And, and the counselor invited us to have more of the lantern consciousness as we're walking through nature. And the other ex experiment they had us do is then we released hands in the circle and we spread out and we held our arms out to the side, you know, 180 degrees, and then looked gently forward and we practiced seeing both hands from out to the sides, right? You can even do that right now. Put your arms out to your side. And then rest with the eyes in, in sort of a downward cast, straight ahead. Just feel so if you can see both hands. If not, maybe move them a little closer. And, but it, that's the feeling. And I thought, oh, that was so, so much like what I've learned in Dzogchen, the Great Perfection teachings where you sky gaze. Often we're instructed to even have the eyes lift to the point just above the horizon. I've taught that a few times here in this class. That gives a different feeling, but still that instruction is the same. Feel as if you could see 360 degrees around you. Yeah. Good. I'm glad that helped. Who else? Okay. All right. So we are moving on in our chat. Can I ask a quick question? Sorry. Please do. Um, when you envision the orb of light, mm. you know, and yeah. do you have some other, like just, I'm really wanting to kind of capture that. Um, and it feels like it's, it's elusive a little bit for me because mm. Do you have any more images or ways of kind of conjuring that? Because that that mm -hmm. will ramp up to it, that feels like the essence of Tonglen. Because then you, it's sort mm -hmm. of the the furnace that we, yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah, it might be more of a feeling of the furnace, kind of you know, like a furnace, that kind of ignition, right? You have the the gas is there, and then you put the the match to it, and then there's this whoop, right? Mm -hmm. So if you can, with awareness in the breath the breathing in and out directly there, even just start with a little kindling, like a little tiny spark that then is kindled by the the breath. I mean, I know I guided that tonight. I don't always do that. Maybe that even wasn't helpful. Sometimes that can be helpful. That can be helpful for me is to kind of grow it, mm. you know, sort of grow it. It's small, like a little spark, and then it, it builds like a ember, right? 
Uh, I also, I do imagine like what the sun looks like in the sky. I put it in my heart. Mm. I feel that. Um, that helps me. Sometimes it's more of a feeling than a visual sense. And sometimes it sort of just stays elusive, but I know it's there somewhere. I know that as I'm breathing in, the, the, the negativity or the smoky vapor or whatever we're working with is transformed and can't harm me. Mm -hmm. Right? It is, they can't harm me. And so even if I don't feel the warm orb of light in my heart, I know that that principle of consciousness is there, that knowingness, that heart. The, they, they call it like the innermost cave of the heart. Mm -hmm. it's, the, it's called the Hridaya. Hridaya. Hridaya is heart, and it's that innermost cave cave of or cavern or space found within the heart chakra you know if you see kind of ancient diagrams of the heart of the chakras they're spoked kind of multi-pedaled wheels that sit in a sort of lateral structure moving up the central channel and yet in the middle, there's always space. There's like the little, the pistol, right, of that lotus blooming. There's the central space. And that's that hridaya, that innermost heart. And that's where it's like the spark of your soul or your consciousness lives. And that's what we're kind of inhabiting, we're aerating, we are enlivening with the breath. I, I'm remembering that in Pema Chodron's book, Start Where You Are, she'll say, first, even before you do the texture breathing, just pr practice breathing in and out of the heart. Like, I hope you got that, that it's like the direct breathing. You're not, you're kind of bypassing the nose or the mouth. You're just imagining that you're breathing directly into the heart and breathing out directly from the heart in all directions. I hope that was clear. There are other instructions that say, imagine that you're breathing in and the smoky vapor is breathing in through the nose like you're vacuuming up the negativity in the form of a smoky vapor. That can be interesting to play with too. That's an old instruction. But the way I've, I've grown to feel most natural with and fond towards is this direct, not so literal, like being a vacuum cleaner <laughs> with my nose. But you can try that. It's totally viable. And noticing what she says is just to first notice what it's like there. Sort of like what Michael said, that starting with, how am I? Like, what's here right now? So what's there right now? Is the heart sort of closed off? Is it tight? Is there fear guarding it? Does it feel disconnected? You know, maybe you just need to practice breathing in and out of it for a while just to feel it. I think we did that for a little bit. So maybe if you want to spend more time doing that, that'll help open that little portal to your innermost ridaya, where there's the little hearth, <laughs> like a little cave with a hearth fire in there. Mm. I can't see you. I wish I could see you. There you are. Hi, Jason. So uh, then, then you can let the breath, you know, like a billows. Mm -hmm. It's building that. And then you feel that, and then you sort of leave that, then that's there, and then you focus on whatever you're working with. But with each in-breath, it's coming in and enlivening that, and that's your like your medicine orb, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, that then can send out the healing remedy, whatever intuitively you feel like you'd like to send out. That's super helpful. Thank you. Yeah, okay, good. Yeah, sometimes natural metaphors are really just the little hook that we need to help us click and go, oh, I see. Just like what Michael said, the 360 degrees helped him feel that. So whatever works for you. Sometimes they say it's like the size of an orange. So sometimes for a while I was imagining a nice juicy orange. <laughs> it's about that size. Okay. Anyone else? Um, yeah, I'd like to um, say something. Please. I'm in the dark, so I can't turn my video on. Sorry. That's all right. Um, I, that's Genevieve, uh, Geneva. Geneva. Yeah. Hi, Geneva. Hi. 
Um, I listened to Pima Children's, her lecture that she gave a couple weeks ago, mm. and it started me doing the Lojong. And I, um, I've been doing it every day, and it's been really powerful for me. But I've been avoiding doing the Tonglen, and I've had trouble with it before. And tonight mm. was really beautiful. It was great that I, for the first time ever, I really was able to do it. And thank you so much. And I'll add, I just did a four hour drive and I listened to the Grateful Dead on Sirius. They were playing, <laughs> let your love light shine. Oh, and I yes. kept saying <laughs> during, the, during the Tonglen, let your love light shine. That's right. There you go. There's your hook. <laughs> Yes, that could be our Tonglen theme song. Yes. Yes, love your, let your love light shine. Mm. Anyway, thank you so much. That was really beautiful. Thanks for sharing that. That's fun. And I'm glad that this helped you. You know, they post these recordings on YouTube. So anytime, if you wanted to fast forward or, you know, just do the meditation, you could replay it if that helps you. Or otherwise, just remember as much as you can for your own guiding and your own personal practice. I plan to listen to it again. Yeah. Yes, it's great. How does that melody go? The Let Your Love Light Shine? Yeah. It's it's a Bobby Ware song, so it's a really fast kind of country. Yeah. Well, cowboy, not country. And he's just like, let your love light shine. That's and right. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he was inspired by Tonglen. You know, I was also thinking, I, I don't know if uh, Michelle Obama is uh, practices Buddhism or what, but uh, mm -hmm. I don't know if you're aware that she just uh, came up with a, a new book called uh, The Light We Carry, The Light oh. We Carry. And the description of the book says something about a toolkit for all, you know, the suffering that we're seeing in the world and this and that. So I'm really curious about it, but, uh, you know, it's right. Yeah, sounds good. I'm sure yeah. it's good. And I, I don't know, I just seem it's like right along what you say. I mean, we all in essence are good and we all have this wonderful light where we yeah. have kindness and we just have to uh, peel that onion, right? I mean, like, uh, get rid of that, those destructive emotions. And, uh, yeah. but we all have, we all have that light. Yes, yes. So, anyway, just a comment. Yeah, thank you. Well, that's a great segue to the topic here of um, the chapter we're, we're exploring. We'll just touch on it lightly, you know, it's, it's a short chapter. And, um, you know, we have about 15 minutes, so I thought I'd move us, move the ball forward a little bit with this book. We're practically at the end. There's just one more chapter after this, and it's more explaining the different, the eight chariots, the eight primary line lineages of Buddhism in Tibet. So really, this is, in a sense, kind of like the, mo the, the, the final meditative chapter, contemplative topic. Uh, it's called Overcoming Inner Demons. It's chapter 16. In my book, it's page 259 of On the Path to Enlightenment. This is our book study that we've been doing, On the Path to Enlightenment. Before I forget, I also want to let you know that I will be on holiday next week, and so I'm working on getting a substitute teacher. So just sort of warning you, Eve is also having a much-needed holiday, so uh, I just wanted to say that now I forgot earlier um, okay so this one called overcoming inner demons and just like Claudia said you know in, intrinsically we're good we have this Buddha nature this basic goodness within us and yet it, in a sense it gets clouded over or covered due to you know different afflictive emotions and thoughts and uh, karmic patterns or conditioning from childhood or maybe even past lives and in a sense, those karmas uh, sort of cover or cloud that nugget of gold within us, which is our Tathagata Garbha, our Buddha essence, our Buddha nature. And everybody has it. 
an ant, an insect has it, a human being has it. We all have it. It just it depends on what we do with it. So that's why we practice nonviolence towards beings, because they, like us, hope to be free of suffering. They long for comfort and food and nourishment and happiness. So why would we harm them if we could avoid it? Uh, and so this chapter starts with a little summary, as usual, by M Matthew Ricard, talking about the, um, the so-called demons, these dre in Tibetan, D-R-E, is sometimes translated as devils, sometimes demons. I prefer demons. Uh, and it's what we work with in the feeding your demons practice, for those of you who've done that. And for those of you who've done that, you know that demons aren't these external goblins or monsters out there. It is, they are actually our afflictive emotions, our habits, our hopes, our fears that obstruct or keep us from feeling freedom, to keep us from being free, from being happy, from realizing that tathagata garba, tathagata, it's T-A-T-H-A, G-A, T-A. That's Tathagata. literally means the one who's, trans, who's traversed, gone to the other shore. And that, that's Tathagata. And then Garbha, G-A-R-B-H-A, literally means seed or womb. Womb. So seed or womb, depending on the context. And that is what's translated as Buddha nature, like the essence of our enlightened mind, transcending and going beyond suffering. So what obstructs that are these these so-called demons. And um, it talks, the, this introduction talks about on the eve of the Buddha's enlightenment, he was kind of attacked by varying degrees of um, illusions, delusive appearances that appeared as demons that were really manifestations of his hopes and fears, right? Mara is uh, the Sanskrit word for this demon, the devil who came to try to tempt him off his path of awakening. Why? Because Mara knew that if the Buddha awakened, then he would be obsolete. There's no need for the the demon has no power if there's no fear. And so he tried to tempt the Buddha with his beautiful daughters, seductive dancers, of course, because the Buddha was a male, and hetero, heterosexual male, <laughs> cisgender Buddha. And so then uh, that didn't work, and then Maro sent armies and shot arrows, and in the face of the Buddha's love, those arrows wilted and fell to the ground. And then finally, Mara says, Well then, if you think you're so great, what right do you have to transcend suffering and to become a Buddha? And the Buddha said, Through the power of my many lifetimes, I have come to this point in my life, and I'm ready. And the Mara, Mara said, well, who is your witness? And the Buddha reached down and touched the earth and said, the earth is my witness. And in that moment, the earth trembled. And in some tellings of the story, the earth goddess, Prithivi, reaches up, comes up from the earth and reaches up and touches him and blesses him. And then in that moment, Mara you know, kind of slinked away and disappeared into the darkness. And then the Buddha progressed through the stages of awakening, shedding the veils, shedding the veils, and then, la, you know, the final moment of his awakening happened as the sun rose in the morning under the Bodhi tree. So there are all these different versions of the story, but all of this point to these, the, the hopes and the fears, the, the doubt the obstacles that keep us from knowing who we really are, right? So we can see ourselves in that story of the Buddha. And classically in the sutras, it's talked, uh, this demons are talked about in four ways. 
um, the first is demon of the aggregates, which are the, um, the skandhas. It's really the, um, the, the heaps. It's kind of a clunky translation. These aspects that make up a sense of who we are, selfhood. So aggregates, the five aggregates are form, made up of the five elements of earth, fire, water, air, and space, come together to make appearance, form, body, flesh, and bone. And then feeling, because we're in a body, we, because we have form, we feel. That's the second, feeling. Because we have feeling and we're in a body, we have the third, which is called perception. We perceive reality. We we think things are out there and we're in here. That's the third, perception. The fourth is because we have those prior three, we create karmas. And it's called karmic volition. Sangskaras, this kind of karmic grooves like the neuronic pathways that are forged through habit through karmas, which is just action. So that fourth one is karmic volition. And then the fifth, based on the prior four, is consciousness. Consciousness. Which is not consciousness with a capital C, like Rigpa or awareness, but consciousness like, because we're in a living, breathing, thinking system, we are aware, we're conscious. And those five aspects are the five skandhas, or the five heaps, but also, like Thich Nhat Hanh would say, the five rivers, tributaries, that converge to make one big river called the self, the sense of self. And the Buddha taught that that, pr- that sense of self is actually empty of intrinsic existence. It's an illusion based on those five aspects. And even those five aspects are not intrinsically existing. That everything is in flux and, and permanent, interrelated, arising and dissolving. And that brings us to that experience of emptiness. So the so-called demon of the aggregates, the skandhas, is that illusory fixation that we are that, that that is us, that we are just that. That as the Buddha taught, we're so much more. We're actually the spark of awakening. We are Buddha nature in our essence. So that is the first. Um, then there's the demon of uh, of death. It's called chidak, chidaki, de, chidaki de. That's Tibetan for the demon of death. And really what that is, is the fear of death. And that because we're afraid of dying, we posture, we protect, we, we're jealous, we're competitive, we, we, com- we, we, maybe we swindle and cheat <laughs> in order to get what we need and protect and, you know, do everything we can to avoid death, of course, but also our fear, to avoid our fear of death. So that's the other demon, the demon of death. Then the next one is demon of afflictive emotions. So I'm on the second paragraph here of 259 where he's laying these out. And the demon of afflictive emotions, uh, sometimes translated as mental afflictions, I think they kind of cross the line of thoughts and feelings, thoughts and emotions. But these are the five poisons of ignorance, aversion or hatred, arrogance or conceit, you could call it. The fourth is desire, attachment, or craving is a common way of translating that. And then the fifth is jealousy. And it said that these five poisons then proliferate and create all other experiences of suffering. There aren't just these five, of course, we know. There's terror, there's fear, there's competitiveness, there's 
um, desperation, depression, but all of those grow out of these five afflictive emotions. They're called kleshas, kleshas. So then the fourth demon is the demon of a self, and that is said to be the root demon. Why? Because that clinging onto a a sense of self, the duck in Tibetan, is what causes all the other forms of suffering, all the other demons to arise. And therefore, most Dharma practices eventually lead us to really, like really either whether it's through vipassana, analyzing, through meditative inquiry, the nature of self, the nature of other, the nature of reality, really viscerally, uh, directly having an experience of emptiness, the the lack of intrinsic existence of this so-called self that seems to be so solid but is really just a confluence of these five aggregates by loosening the grip of the ego fixation, the clinging, through meditation, like in what we were doing earlier, the first part of our meditative practice, when you observe the mind, you see it take form and grasp and then release and you can let go. And then eventually that grip gets looser and looser and then you can rest with an open palm. You don't have to grasp the thoughts. They can bubble up. But you don't have to identify on with them, onto them. And so that is the experience of coming down to the root demon, which is the demon of self-clinging or self. And when you cut that at the root, then the other sufferings dissolve. So those are the, that's the sutric teachings on the nature of demons, these things that aren't outside of us, but actually are internal dynamics that cause us to suffer. And the, the bottom of 259, I know we're almost at time, uh, Matthew Ricard says, the demon of negative emotions generally become apparent to us that when it reaches a certain intensity, for example, our anger explodes, our jealousy eats eats away at us, or ignorance blinds us. But in reality, it is an old enemy that we have unconsciously befriended and learned to foster. It can even appear as virtuous, it's the top of 260, it can even appear to be virtuous, reasonable and logical, as in the case of hatred based on sectarian arguments. So as Dharma practitioners, we need to kind of sniff out the demons, even if they appear virtuous. And then Machi Glavdran, this is the only woman quoted in the whole book. (laughs) And it's this quote, which is, it's a fine quote. It's not her best, (laughs) but I want to cover it really quick is, she says, it's the middle of 260. Machi Glavrin was the founder of the Chud, the severance tradition, and a very profound teacher that in, influenced all the main lineages of Tibetan Buddhism. She says, the source of the demon is our own mind. When the mind apprehends phenomena and fixates on them, it becomes the demon's prey. So in a sense, the fixating mind becomes the prey of the demon, meaning ego identity, ego fixation, the kleshas, the skandhas, fear of death. But when you're not fixating, thoughts, feelings can arise, but if you're not grasped on and identified, or sometimes I say face planted on with them, (laughs) right, onto them, and identified closely to them, then the mind isn't, or this, um, the mind isn't the prey. Nothing can harm you in that sense. When the mind takes itself as an object, it is spoiled. And so basically what she's saying, it's kind of a weird translation, but what that means is, is when the mind reifies itself as a sense of self, then it's really, then you're really gone. It's spoiled.
So when the mind, which is really the subject, reifies it as an object, as a thing, then it's all downhill from there. <laughs> That's what she's saying, basically. Does that make sense? It's kind of a strange translation. But if you take what's the subject and make it the object, then you're in delusion. Oh, Chandra. Chandra needs to act smart and be good at what she does. Oh, Chandra's writing a book. Oh, it better be good. <laughs> yeah, those are real thoughts that Chandra has sometimes. <laughs> but see, I'm making me an object and then I'm reifying it. And then it's, then it's spoiled. Then it's just, then. But if you can rest in awareness and see those thoughts bubble up. Oh, there's the eye maker again. Ha ha ha, I see you, you old clown. <laughs> then I don't have to suffer. Maybe I can even laugh. Maybe it can be a source of humor. So, uh, who knows? Maybe our next book... For a book study will be one of Machik's books or a book about her and her practices. I'm planting a seed. That's what we're considering. So, you know, whoever subs next class may talk a little bit more about that or might move on to the next topic. I think that, that um, in a sense, we can also on one level feel that this is, is complete. But if you have the book, uh, I recommend reading about the the different lineages. It's interesting, but I don't think we need to talk about it in class. So thank you, everybody. I want to respect your time, and thank you for being here tonight and for your practice. I hope you found it fruitful. I hope uh, if you can give to the collective, please do so. We really value your donations. They help us turn on the lights and keep Zoom running. Um, yeah, would you like to say anything, Claudia? Thank you so much, Sandra. Yeah.